I have backed myself up into the second point that I want to make about writing humor, which is that comedy doesn't get you off the hook when it comes to truth. Fiction is art that requires the strictest attention to the real, Flannery O'Connor says, and this is true whether you're writing comedy or drama, whether you're writing in the realistic or fantastic realm. Not that one has to offer little literal reality in one's work. Edgar Carrot has no interest in literal reality, yet he does what Flannery O'Connor said Kafka did when he wrote The Metamorphosis. He uses a certain distortion to get at the truth. In Carrot's short story, Lie Land, Habitual liar Robbie finds himself in lie land where he has to meet the various falsehoods he's told over the years. Specifically, he encounters the damaged animals and sick people he's used to get out of obligations. He has to meet all the injuries his imagination has brought to life. A fascinating premise, all the more because we are in the world of the essentially, if not the literary real, not so when we are with people pooping into the heat vent. Truth is as important in comic fiction as it is in serious fiction. The novels of Park, Ferris, Shipstead, and Levine work because they are genuine examinations of social class, of office life, and family life. In a 1997 lecture at Warren Wilson, Rick Russo said that the comic worldview is as rigorously truthful as tragic one. It looks at all facets of the human condition and has the same desire to show readers through the narrative how the world works. Bruce emphasized that he is a man who loves funny details, but not ones that come at the expense of truth. For him, the real world is funny, and his job is to show how and why it is. Seth Greenland's The Angry Buddhist doesn't work for me, precisely for the reason Auslander's book doesn't work for me. It's not offensive by any means, and it's very well written. The descriptions in particular are enormously well done. But it isn't the sort of book that you put down and say, yes, that's just how it is. It's more the book sort of book that, you, that makes you think, hey, that'd make a good movie. Part of this is the setting. <laughs> the money West Coast, where bodies are always taught, minds less so. And part of this is the principal characters, who are the same characters you might see in a police procedural. I don't know these people, and I don't recognize them. But is this because I've never been to LA? Because I've spent most of my life in New England? I don't think so. There's an essential selfishness and cruelty to the characters that feels untrue. Am I just being naive about the worlds in which I don't operate? Julian Barnes' sense of an ending is about an English man trying to understand the events of his past. I don't know the people in his book. They all exist in worlds which I don't operate. And yet they are recognizable to me, recognizable even as they act in moments with great selfishness and cruelty. They seem like people rather than characters. As much as I enjoy Treasure Island, the exclamation points, <laughs> And it's such a wonderful food. I felt it broke down at the end because it made the same mistake that Auslander and Greenland made. Though the narrative is selfish throughout the book, she's really terrible in the end. She's actually too terrible to be believable. Now granted, she hasn't been believable in a conventional way in many parts of the book, but her behavior for most of the book gets at a human truth. At the end, there was one moment when the narrator attacks her sister with a penknife. I didn't feel like the author was getting at human truth anymore. I didn't feel, to borrow Rousseau's phrasing, the author was showing me how and why the things of this world were funny. I felt she was making things up. At, the moment, at that moment, the book ceased being funny to me, and it ceased working as literary fiction. 